In this screencast, we begin our discussion of inverses of exponential functions. Let's begin by looking at example 10.4. Consider the exponentially growing function given by the equation y equals f of x equals 2 to the x. Part A. Complete the following input-output table for this function and then figure out what the input-output table for the inverse function g would look like. Okay, let's start by completing the input-output table for the original function y equals 2 to the x. So we have six different values for the input variable x. If we substitute negative 2 into the function, we get 2 raised to the negative 2 power. Recall that this is defined to be 1 over 2 squared, which would be the same as 1 fourth. So when x is negative 2, the output y is 1 fourth. Now let's substitute negative 1 into the function. We arrive at 2 to the negative 1 power. This is defined to be 1 over 2 to the 1, which of course is 1 half. So when x is negative 1, the output y is 1 half. Now let's substitute 0 into the function. We arrive at 2 to the 0, which is defined to be 1. If we substitute the value 1 in, we arrive at 2 to the 1, which is 2. If we substitute the value 2 into the function, we arrive at 2 squared, which is 4. If we substitute 3 into the function, we arrive at 2 cubed, which is 2 times 2 times 2, which of course is 8. Okay, now let's figure out what the input-output table for the inverse function would look like. The first column has the inputs of the inverse function. You can tell because the letter x is given in the parentheses and so, and so that means x must be representing the input. The outputs will be in the second column and they are represented by the letter y. So once again, with these two functions we're using the letter x to represent the input of the function and we're using the letter y to represent the output of the function. Same thing over here. x represents the input inputs of this function and the letter y will represent the outputs of this function. So, if I put 1 fourth into the inverse function, what should the output be? Well, recall that inverse functions have reversed inputs and outputs. If I go back to my earlier table, if I put negative 2 in, I get an output of 1 fourth. That would mean that if I started with 1 fourth as my input, the inverse function should give me negative 2 back again. So I get a negative 2. If I substitute 1 half into the inverse function, I should get a negative 1 coming out because, again, the inputs and outputs are reversed from each other. So I get a negative 1. If I substitute 1 into the inverse function, I should get a 0. If I substitute 2 in, I should get a 1. If I substitute 4 in, I should get a 2. And if I substitute 8 into the inverse function, I should get a 3 coming out. So you can see the input-output pairs are reversed in these tables. Now let's have a look at the graphs of these two inverse functions. On the axes provided, sketch the graphs of these inverse functions f and g. You can use the input-output tables from part a to help. The diagonal line y equals x has already been drawn for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and start by plotting some points for the graph of the function f. Remember that the graph of the function f it, the function f is an exponentially growing function, and so when we're plotting these points, we should be seeing the right behavior for the graph of an exponential function. Let's see. So when x is negative 2, 
the output y is 1 fourth. That would give us a point right about there. When x is negative 1, we have an output of a half, which would be about there. When x is 0, we have an output of 1. When x is 1, we have an output of 2. When x is 2, we have an output of 4. And when x is 3, we have an output of 8. And so if I connect my dots, I have a curve that looks like this. And that is exactly what a growing exponential functions graph would look like. So this is the graph of y equals 2 to the x. Now let's sketch a graph of the inverse of this function using, using the input-output pairs from our table. When x is 1 fourth, y is negative 2. So we have the input-output pair 1 fourth comma negative 2. And if I plot that, I get a point approximately right there. Then I have 1 half comma negative 1. It should be about right there. 1 comma 0 would be about there. 2 comma 1, 4 comma 2, 8 comma 3. If I plot the graph based on those points, I arrive at a curve that looks like this. So this is a graph of the inverse function g of x. So this is the inverse. Let's look at part c. From looking at the graph of the inverse function g, can you tell if it's a linear function? Or is it an exponential function? Well, here's the graph of our inverse. Is this a linear function? I think you can see it is clearly not a linear function since the graph is not a line. So is it linear? The answer is no. Um, is it exponential? So does this look like the graph of an exponential function? To answer this question, you have to think back to what graphs of exponential functions can look like. Well, they can take two forms. An exponentially growing function would have a graph that looks like this. An exponentially decaying function will have a graph that looks like this. So the graph that we have, does it have either of these forms? And the answer is no, it does not. So is the inverse an exponential function? Again, the answer is no. So we started with an exponential function, 2 to the x, and its inverse is this unknown function. It's not linear, it's not exponential, and we'll have to figure out what it actually is. Okay, let's look at the next example, 10.5. Consider the exponentially decaying function given by the equation y equals s at x equal to 1 half raised to the x. You can tell that this is an exponentially decaying function because the factor here, the r value, is 1 half, and that's smaller than 1. So this is a decaying exponential function. Let's look at part a. Complete the following input-output table for the function and then figure out what the input-output table for the inverse function, r, would look like. So, in comparison with our last example, we had an exponentially growing function. Now we have an exponentially decaying function and we should be seeing that in our values as we complete this table. Notice here our input values are growing, and as they grow, we should be seeing a decrease in our output values. So if we substitute the value negative 2 into our function, we arrive at a value of 1 half to the negative 2 power. This is defined to be 1 over 1 half squared. 1 half squared is equal to 1 fourth. So what we have here 
is 1 divided by 1 fourth. That's the same thing as 1 multiplied by the reciprocal, 4 over 1, which is 4. So when we put negative 2 into this function, we get an output of 4. Now let's substitute negative 1 in. We get 1 half to the negative 1. This is 1 over 1 half to the 1, which is the same thing as 1 divided by a half, or 1 times 2 which is 2. So when we put negative 1 into this function, we arrive at an output of 2. If I substitute 0 into this function, we arrive at 1 half raised to the 0 power, which is defined to be 1. If I substitute 1 in, I get 1 half raised to the first power, which is half. If I substitute 2 into this function, I get 1 half, the quantity squared, which is 1 fourth. And lastly, if we substitute 3 into the function equation, we arrive at 1 half the quantity cubed, which is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half, which is the same as 1 eighth. Now let's move on to the input-output table for the inverse function. This function is being named R. The letter X is playing the role of the input, Y is the output. So this column has different input values for this function, and this column has the outputs for this function. Notice that the input values that were selected here are exactly the same as the output values that we got from this function. Also recall that the input, inputs and outputs of these two functions are reversed. So if we get these values as outputs of this function, and we take these values and we put them into our inverse function, we should get these inputs back out. So when, for an input of 4, I have an output of negative 2. For an input of 2, I have an output of negative 1. And finishing the table, we have 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now let's have a look at the graphs of these two functions. On the axes provided, sketch graphs of the inverse functions S and R. You can use the input-output tables from part A, and the diagonal line has already been drawn for you. Recall that the diagonal line acts like a mirror. When we've graphed the two functions, the two inverse functions, we should see mirror images on either side of the diagonal. So let's begin by sketching a graph of our original function s by plotting a few points. When x is negative 2, the output is 4. When x is negative 1, the output is 2. When x is 0, the output is 1. When x is 1, the output is a half. When x is 2, the output is a fourth. And when x is 3, the output is an eighth. So you can see a general trend Oops. looks like this. And this is the exact kind of behavior you would expect from a decaying exponential. So this is a graph of s of x equaling 1 half to the x. Now let's go and sketch a graph of the inverse function. When x is 4, the output is negative 2. When x is 2, the output is negative 1. When x is 1, the output is 0. When x is a half, the output is 1. When x is 1 fourth, the output is 2. And when x is 1 eighth, the output is 3. So we can see a general trend in the shape of this graph as well. Now if you look at the diagonal, if you go and look back at the diagonal, you should see the picture on one side of the diagonal is kind of the mirror image of what you see on the other side of the diagonal.
and again this is the graph of r of x which is the inverse. Let's look at part c. From looking at the graph of the inverse function r, is it a linear function? Is it an exponential function? Well, is it linear? You can see from the shape of the r of x graph that it is not linear. Is it exponential? Recall that the shape of exponential graphs take two forms. You have either exponential growth or you have exponential decay. Notice that if you have exponential decay, the graph approaches the x-axis axis, but it never crosses the axis. And that's not what we see happening here. The graph crosses the x-axis, but then it keeps going down. So the graph we have does not appear to fit either of these two forms, and therefore it is not exponential. From the two examples that you've seen in this screencast, first with the exponentially growing function, and secondly now with the exponentially decaying function, you learn two things. First, inverses of exponential functions are not linear nor exponential. Second, you learned what the graphs of the inverses look like. If you recall, when we had an exponentially growing function like this, the inverse, remember it's going to be the mirror image over the diagonal, the inverse basically looks like that. And when we had an exponentially decaying function, like this, the inverse, again here's that diagonal, the inverse effectively looks like that. So even though we don't know what these inverse functions are yet, we do know what their graphs must look like. So what are these inverse functions? If they're not linear and they're not exponential, but we know what their graphs look like, what are they? They are in fact called logarithmic functions, or logarithms for short. In the next screencast, we'll introduce logarithmic functions.